Let's do it. Hello, Lindsay. I'm so excited that you're on the show, finally. Yay, me too. I know we got to hang out in person as well really recently, so this will be a good conversation. We got to meet in person in California, well, at so many events. I feel like we... (laughs) (laughs) She was popping around. I kind of hung out with her at lots of them. Yeah. (laughs) I was just stalking. I was like, where's Lindsay? There she is. I'll hang out with her. Uh, It was so much fun. I loved it. And at one of the events, Lindsay just blew my mind and was talking about, well, you came up with a really cool name for it. What was the name? Well, the survey formula. It's the not survey formula. <laughs> the Maybe. sexy survey formula. <laughs> sexy survey formula. We'll work on that. We'll work it's, on that. <laughs> by the end of the episode, we'll have a really awesome name. There you go. There you go. Or, or please DM me and message me what you think it should be called after you listen to this. Right. Um, but I, I love this method. And I was saying before we hit record, and this is why, before like we go into who Lindsay is and you know this, this amazing survey, sexy survey formula, what was so amazing is right now I'm doing all my research, market research in the Instagram DMs mainly. So I'll ask mm. questions and you... All of you listeners are so amazing at responding with very helpful things, audio messaging me back. And of course, I'm still going to be doing that, of course, but that is not scalable. And right Mm -hmm. now at the point where I have a team, I have to make sure that my market research is actually scalable. And Lindsay's survey formula has allowed me to have this system with our product to make it Mm -hmm. scalable. And you'll see exactly what I'm talking about whenever she goes into the formula step by step. But now my team is able to be a part of the market research process. Now my team can look at these specific surveys that Lindsay recommends that we have and they can pull out copy and they can pull out that stuff. And the, the fact that they're actually doing that, it's going to click in their brains more so that it's not mm-hmm. all on my shoulders, which is so helpful. <laughs> so yeah. That, that was huge for me, and I know it's going to be huge for you as well. Before we dive into all this amazing goodness, who are you? Who am I? <laughs> Great question. Um, <laughs> who am I? Who's my human, my being, my soul? No. Um, yes. So I'm an ex-professor turned accidental entrepreneur. Uh, I taught sociology at community college for many years, and I literally spent my first 30 years of my life just like in a classroom, loving knowledge, going super far with my degree. And I knew I always wanted to teach. And so um, I I think part of the reason why I knew I always wanted to teach is I love hearing myself talk, which is great now (laughs) for running a business, having a podcast, you know, doing webinars. But it's true. Like I love sharing information and knowledge and watching light bulb moments go off in my students' heads. That's like what teaching is to me. And so I accidentally started a a business and I really mean that. I was not looking looking to exit like some nine to five or some torturous workplace, quite the opposite. I like landed my dream job. I got tenure track. I was on a tenure track position as well. And this was it. That was the goldmine. And it's actually really hard to do as a, as a professor to get that job. So, um, I accidentally started a business and started listening to some podcasts. I, I came up through the like network marketing space. And, um, when I started to realize that I could make an extra thousand dollars a month, that was kind of like, huh, that's possible. And then listening to some podcasts to get better at it, that's when I realized, why am I selling someone else's thing? I could totally sell my own thing. And that was the beginning of the end of my official, you know, professional teaching career. Uh, but I created a business that, that took all the things that I knew um, and had studied my entire life, which was teaching and learning. Um, I had taught online my entire teaching career. I was, I was the professor at the, you know, um, online, I I forget what they call it in, in higher ed, just like the, the like online courses. I forget what they call it. Like the department of like something learning, something stupid lame, but I was on those, in those meetings and, and I was the professor having Google hangout office hours with my online student. Oh, that's awesome. No one was doing that when Google Hangout came out. And that was like 10 years ago, probably now. And I realized that if I went live with them and, and had the recording posted in the group that I didn't have to answer emails because without fail, my students asked the same questions of yep. whatever content was that week. And I would say, did you watch the office hours? And they'd be like, no. And I'm like, cool. The answer's in there. And it was like, I didn't have to wow. be in the inbox as much. And so 
I'd always been playing with like unique ways to teach online and to do it better. And so when I realized that entrepreneurs needed help with that, that's really when mm. my business took off. And then I decided, yeah, I could leave this and I could teach in a bigger way because the world is a classroom. It doesn't yep. have to be these few people that get lucky to have me at a specific college. Yep. Like it's the world. So my message grew bigger and my, my mission kind of grew um, uh, as a result, but still using my same talents and um, things that I'm obsessed with. Oh, I love that story. And I love how you ended it with the world is your classroom. Mm -hmm. It's so empowering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like the cool thing is I, I, I definitely attract a lot of teachers, <laughs> a lot of academics. I have an, a podcast mm -hmm. called Academics Mean Business um, because I felt alone. Like I must be the only weird person like who left yeah. perfect job. Um, but you know, there, there is something to be said for educators. They're, they're, they went into education because they want to serve. Um, and we didn't do it for the money. And then it's like, well, what if you could serve more people and money is a byproduct of that? And it actually is a resource for you to be able to serve more people. And that's a big mindset shift that I had to have as somebody who came from the serve first and like money is like not that important. Now I'm realizing how important it is to really spread a message or get your information out there. And people who have been teaching for a long time or have professional experience, I mean, you have that credential to back you up. And there's probably a larger audience than you currently have, even if it's in a classroom, that you can share your knowledge with. And so they really make for really great entrepreneurs, I think, educators do at least. Yeah, yeah, because they can yeah. break down those topics into something simple and tangible. Mm -hmm. and, and that's key. If you can do that. That's everything in yeah. many ways. My, well, everything. then the marketing. You got to get people to buy stuff. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. there is that. Yeah. There is that part. So what we're going over today is once they buy your stuff, how yeah. can we create surveys? And you, I know all of you listening have heard the word survey and you've heard, mm -hmm. oh, you should have a survey to your audience. We're not talking about that. Okay. This is not some crappy survey that you're getting, not that your surveys are crappy, but I'm, I'm just being very dramatic right now. <laughs> you send some crappy survey to your audience and say, I'll give you a $15 Amazon gift card if you answer this and it shows you what your next product is. We mm -hmm. are not talking about that. We are talking about a specific survey system that once they become your customer, how you can track their progress, how you mm -hmm. can actually view how they're feeling, their emotions, their everything. And then you can use that in your marketing to attract more people that are already your favorite people that have bought. So this is a, this is a different way of thinking about surveys. I know we yep. hear survey and we think, Ugh, this is not yeah. that. Yeah. I love it. I like basically Haley, I'm like, oh yeah, that's really good. <laughs> 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 having seen my talk on it, but it's true. <laughs> like what we're talking about here is how do we get how our customer is feeling during our training or course product typically. So most of us have some sort of digital product or maybe we're working on one, which is, which is important too, or maybe that's a future, you know, goal that you have. And the key here is it's not just a market research of like everyone on your email list who has bought something. We're talking about market research for people that are going through your stuff, right? These are your students and you as the teacher need to listen to them. Okay. So this is after you've kind of been, ha you have the course running for a little while and this is something you can implement even if it feels like your course has been going on for like three or four years, like still implement this because it's, it's super valuable. Um, so the, the survey system that I've created and the, the way to break it down is in three steps. The first step is ask, the second step is listen, and the third step is tweak. And that's the tweaking of your content based on that. So what do you ask people? That's the first step. How do you make a good survey? Uh, and where do you put these surveys in order to ask? So a big mistake that I see many entrepreneurs when it comes to having surveys in their course is they often have um, an onboarding survey, right? So most people have wanted to ask like, oh, I want to collect their information. Maybe they're address, but this is like a really important part of your data collection because you can also 
track where they are right now. Um, in education, like in the college space, what I'm trying to do is figure out where my students are when they come into my classroom, because that shows me two things. It shows me how I can adjust my content to meet them where they're at, and two, like, who's buying, right? Like, who are these people who are giving me their credit card? I think I know, but like, how, do I really know? So um, a bunch of questions that, like a category of questions that you should have in your onboarding survey, the first category of questions would be some related to this market research stuff, right? So, um, you know, I like asking personal questions here because it, it gives you a lens uh, on um, how busy people are, which I think is kind of important when they're, going through your content. So you can ask questions like, you know, what stage of business are you in? And you can give them some options. You can ask questions like what their income is per month. You can ask questions about their family life if you want. Like, hey, do you have kids? Like, you know, it doesn't have to be very serious. Like, you know, uh, on a, you know, zero to 1000 per month or whatever. It doesn't have to only be that. I think some of that personal data allows a student to say, oh, Haley really cares about knowing about who I am as a person, not just how much money I make or, you know, how many uh, followers I have. But these are all kind of questions that you can use to collect information about who your person is. Um, it's also something you can use a little bit later too as the course is running, which I'll share later. Um, but the second uh, group of questions after you get some of those market research type questions are questions related to where they are um, it, uh, with your specific topic. Now, I'm going to take, I'm going to use a very like academic term, but um, I was a social science researcher. So I, this is, comes from quantitative research, <laughs> different types of questions you can ask. But one of them is a Likert scale question. And you're probably familiar with it. It's like on a scale of one to 10 or on a scale from one to five or um, on a scale from zero to five. I mean, you could, you could name it however you want or happy face to sad face, whatever, right? Um, but what you're doing is you're making someone rate like where they are, um, with a specific topic. So when you have a course, you have, um, some results that you've promised your students, right? Like, um, I, I call them storybook endings when I teach how to create a course. Like what is the end result that they want having after they've gone through all my content? So one of my results is to launch a course. Like that's literally what I want them to do. So I would ask a question related to how confident are you to launch a course product? Um, another result I want them to do is to gain confidence actually in teaching in person and live. So I will say, how confident are you hosting live workshops? Um, another one would be, how confident are you... Um, selling your product is something that I think comes out of my work. What are some examples of your uh, maybe profit planner uh, promises? Yeah, I think, I think mine is, does profit planning scare you or how are your Ooh. revenue goals scaring you, paralyzing you? Or um, another question that I'm, I ask a lot is, and I'm trying to think of the way it's worded, but it's about being a perfectionist, like mm. on a scale of one to whatever, do you feel like you have perfectionist tendencies that are paralyzing you from making decisions, like those kind of things. Good questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great. And so the cool thing about Likert scale questions is you can use them later to see and, and track their growth. And this is something that I don't, I, I don't see many people doing. I've heard, and I did this presentation, then Haley was there. There were a lot of people that were like, yeah, I asked those questions, but I don't ask them again. And I was like, that's where you're dropping the ball on this whole system with the math, with the, like the surveys. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's a third category, but that's pretty much it. So there, there, you might want to throw in a question around like, um, Oh no, this is, this is something I want uh, people to put in their surveys. Goal setting. This is a great time to also ask people why they bought the product and what their goals are for themselves. There are some really cool, and I'm not going to get into all the tech, but if you're into automations and stuff like that um, and workflows, and I mean, if you listen to Haley, you probably are, right? So if you have like Zapier, you can actually have Typeform. If you use a, a tool like Typeform to collect the data, um, or you can use like active campaign as well, custom fields. So you can get really ninja on this, but essentially what you can do is you can pull what they've said and deliver it back to them after a length of time automatically. <laughs> right. Um, but even if you don't get that ninja, 
it's still nice to know what their goals are because you can look at this survey if there's some issues coming up in the content or in the course. I and love I, that. yeah. And so like, if you have someone maybe asking for a refund or maybe showing up, um, cause we all have them. It doesn't mean you're a bad teacher, but there's always a student who's like, kind of like Debbie Downer, right? And is like, this yep. won't work for me. It would be awesome if you or someone on your team pulls up their onboarding survey and just see what Debbie Downer's about, right? Oh, maybe, you know, she doesn't have a lot of income. She basically told us like in the survey that her income level, you know, her income is, is invariable or like not consistent. Um, or she told us that she has four kids and her husband's deployed and maybe she's going through a hard time. So it just allows us to give some compassion for the people as they enter um, because we now have that information. If we don't have it, we don't know. Um, and, and that's also a great place where you can scrape those goals and you can get into a private conversation. Now, again, it doesn't have to be you as the educator. It can be a team member who's responsible for community and like taking care of the people. And you can get in a conversation and say, you know, I pulled your goals from the beginning of this course. You know, what's stopping you from keeping this in the front of your mind? Like what, do, how can we support you accomplish them? So now they're recognizing, oh, wow, that survey meant something. Someone's listening and that's really powerful, right? Um, so those are my tips for the onboarding survey. You want to try to get it done, um, as soon as they join as well, that they're at the height of, yep. um, you know, their confidence and that this can work for them. Um, and you know, you definitely want to, uh, be cautious of how long the survey is, but they're also the most likely to fill out this survey compared to the other ones following. Yep. So you can ask a little more because they're excited about you and your product. Um, and so, yeah, there's some great, uh, you can do it in a follow-up sequence when they buy, you can, you can put it in the course modules themselves. There's lots of little strategies and you can see what works for your people. Um, and just see like completion rates, like how many of your students complete it. Um, so that's my tip for the onboarding survey. Well, based on what you said, I, mm -hmm. I'm implementing something in, in our business that once they join the profit planner lounge, cause you can create a profit plan in seven days. So what we're awesome. doing is at the, at the end of the survey, we're going to say, write a future letter to yourself in 60 days and where you want your profit plan to take you in 60 days. Cause it takes seven days to create a profit plan. And then the rest you're integrating, you're making these habits that we teach in the profit plan system. So then we're sending that to them after 60 days of them being in the lounge and saying, okay, either you've hit this or you have it. And if you haven't, that's fine. Let's mm -hmm. use it as data and let's look back and then see why. Because oh. it probably means that you didn't watch all the videos. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> so maybe that just means you actually need to go through the freaking system. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, what, that's how we're implementing that, just for an example. I love it. And that's what's really cool is there are ways to make very special touches yep. to this. And that's what I love about teaching as well. And I love talking about teaching because now I write that down and I'm like, that could be a great activity for a module zero as well. Yeah. So it could be in your onboarding survey or it can be actually a homework assignment in your course. You could get super fancy. You could have it typed up for them and mailed to them old yep. snail mail. Like you could get really cool um, uh, with this or video recording might be easier. I mean, there's lots of fun things that you can do with that. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Um, so the cool thing is, and I think this does a great job also when they come in because from a teaching perspective, from a, an adult learning perspective, which is something I definitely studied, uh, adult learners need to reflect on their own learning. They're mm. very, because they're not in elementary school anymore, right? They're adults. And so they're dedicating their time and they're choosing to take a course from you. And that is an, an in exchange for their own, uh, you know, um, money-making activities, whatever. I mean, I think, I think learning is a money-making activity if you do something with it, right? And so we have to respect that, but we also have to treat them as adults and say, cool, how has this journey gone for you, right? Which leads me into the next part of the system is making sure that they are um, checking in with themselves, right? And so there are two, and I learned this actually from presenting, um, which, is, which is great. I made an adjustment to the system, but there are two ways that you can create an exit survey. We can call them exit. They're not really exiting, but like ending survey, like last module survey, if your course is super linear, 
and you're getting someone from point A to point B relatively quickly, like in four or five modules, and they can really complete all of it pretty fast, you can do something called an exit survey, which is pretty much like, so you finish the content, yay for you, um, you know, and then you ask certain questions as it relates to to how much content they've listened to, maybe how many calls they attended. Um, and you're just checking in, this is for your own teacher self, like how engaged they were, but it also reflects back for the student where they're like, oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't do every worksheet. And it doesn't mean that it's bad, but they're just recognizing how much effort they put in. Um, and then this is where our Likert scale questions come back. This is where we use them again. And this is where it is not happening in any, any course I've been a part of. You now actually go back to your onboarding sec, uh, survey and you pull those questions. How confident are you now, right, launching a course? How confident are you now selling? How confident are you now planning out your profit and your quarterly goals? And so... It doesn't mean you need to get to every student to 10. And I think this is another thing that people don't think about because they're not um, past teachers. Like not every one of my students is gonna be an A plus. It's just, it's just not how it works. But if I can get a student who has a D <laughs> to a B or a C, like that's still a win. And, and most likely they felt that win too. So we just have to ask them, have you had growth? Now you're not getting to ultimate 10, um, but have you seen growth now? And that this is here, here where you get ninja and what, and what Haley was talking about is when you have people on your team, you know, collecting this data, you can now say on your sales page or in your advertisements, you know, 80% of our students see their confidence grow or 80% of our students now are successfully profit planning their quarters. Like, whatever you want to use because you actually have data. And this is what I mean by like, we don't have data if we never ask these questions and it's measurable. It's not just what people think is data is just testimonials. And it's great. I care about how much money Sally made last quarter and that's awesome and, and how quickly she did it and how amazing she feels. But like, I want to catch everybody, even the people who didn't record those videos and see what growth they had, even if they didn't catch it. Because a lot of times as adult learners, we don't give ourselves the credit. We like expected, oh, I didn't hit my goal, so I failed. No, that's not quite true. Like, let's look back at your like right scale and see how you have grown in these other ways. Um, and so the exit survey is really important. And what I got out of presenting this publicly is people are like, well, what if your content isn't so linear? What if there is no end really? Maybe you have a membership site or you have a, con a content that's really like, they don't complete it that quickly. And my response to that was, oh, you can just ask them every 90 days. And so this is what we're implementing as well. So when someone comes in to build a better beta, which is my course, 90 days later, we check in on them. So it's not an exit survey. It's a 90-day check-in survey. And we ask the Likert scale. So the student doesn't have to feel like they've completed it, but now they're reflecting on where they are to their goals. And this would be super ninja if you can bring back their goals and show them, hey, um, this is what you promised yourself 90 days ago. How's it going, right? And so it's not about the end. What did you get from my course? It's about what have you gotten and how active have you been? And this is a great tool too. You can create red flags maybe. Um, if someone rates something really low, like maybe a team member is alerted and is like, oh, this person like said, I, I haven't grown at all. And they're like very just dis like disgruntled. We want to know wh when our students are in that like low place around their own confidence towards your content. Because again, it's not that you're a bad teacher. They are just low in confidence and about how much they can improve. That person needs some extra love and care, right? And what, what system can we build to reach out to them? Yeah. And, you know, something we talked about before was figuring out what their love language is mm. and, and using that. So if someone rates their confidence low, it might mean that we send them a handwritten letter in the mail, yeah. or it might mean that we sit there and we sell, we find a small win and we call them out in the Facebook group and we say, yep. we just want to celebrate Sally Sue for doing this, like whatever it is, figure out what their love. I, yeah. I love I that was that a great, yeah, I forgot who, was that your idea or Jerisha's, I think, mm -hmm, Jerisha mm -hmm. Hawk, yeah, who I know you've had on the podcast. Um, yeah, we yeah. have. 
this is, this is, and what we're talking about really here and, and from the perspective of like, how do I take care of hundreds and thousands of students? That's what Haley and I are concerned about, right? We want to help people with what we know and we want it to be a lot of people, but I don't want it to be a digital product where people feel like I left them hanging and they just have this like series of videos that they're responsible for completing. I want to motivate them and encourage them, but I also can't do that on like me keeping track of it. And that's where these systems coming in place and the team members to execute. And so you as a team can decide how, what, what does your follow-up look like? Where, where are your students going to be struggling? What, how do we show that we love them and care about them? Because that's going to take you so far. And the, I think the key is to just to remember, like the students that are in your current course are like the beginning of like right. your funnel, right? Like if you take good care of them and blow them away, they're going to go tell their friends. They just really, yeah. really will. And they will be on social media talking about you. And that is the best marketing you can ask for. So um, not leaving them hanging um, is huge. And this is where we're listening to them and we're watching their feedback as it comes in. Super key. Yeah. Um, so the last survey, uh, and again, I'm going to obviously say another thing that no one does in the industry. Very few people are doing module level surveys. So not only are you surveying them at the beginning and the end, and I, I tied those two together because I wanted you to see the Likert scale part, but you're now catching the student as they're consuming your content, okay? So it's one of the easiest surveys to go implement, and I'm gonna give you the three questions you ask, and I want every person listening to write them down and like either hand them off to a VA or like do it yourself because it will take literally five minutes. Um, I had people at the event be like, okay, I already did it. And I'm like, that's always great when you get a quick win. So that's this podcast's quick win. Okay, so the module level surveys, you wanna ask like maximum three questions. And these are, quest these are surveys that happen like at every month module in your course or every like main learning um, subject. You don't have to do every lesson. And I, I don't need to get into the nuances of course creation, but like a big topic can have one module. Most students sit down and consume it all at once, most of the time. And so what the survey looks like is the first thing, the first question is, uh, what module is this? And you make it a drop down. And this is so you don't have to actually create six different surveys for every uh, module. You have the student tell, that, tell you what module they are on, and that means it's only one link for every module. So that's a little hack. Um, and you can just sort them when you go to read the data by module. Uh, and then the second one, you, you might want to ask their name and email, and this is a teacher level decision. You don't have to, um, but the reason why I like asking name and email for all my surveys is I actually reward my people for filling out all of them. And so um, if they fill out a, a sur uh, exit survey or one of my 90 days, we actually go back and see how much content they consumed. And if they filled out a survey for each of them, we send them a gift because that's we all know this, like filling out surveys takes time. So you also might want to incentivize your people if that's important to you, but you don't have to. Um, so you would need to have that though, to collect that data, to be able to send them stuff. Um, but so then the meat, meat, meaty questions are the three. So the first question you want to ask is like, what was your biggest aha moment from this lesson or from this module? Um, or like, what was your biggest takeaway? Whatever's on brand for you, but you're basically asking what went really well and what did you totally get from this? Um, this will help you with your teaching. It'll help you realize like, oh yeah, this module helps people do this. And that's a positive. And usually you get really positive stuff um, from that. The second question you want to ask is, is there anything that was confusing? Like, is there anything that made you pause? Like, and say, mm, I don't get it. <laughs> um, and so you can ask that in any way you want. But the, the key is you're having someone say, I didn't quite understand this. And they might not have a, an, um, one of those. And then the last one is, is there something you wish I included? Um, like, is there something missing uh, from this module? And I'm going to give you a warning here. People might say something that's coming later in the course. So they might be like, oh, I wish you told us how to do X, Y, and Z. And you'll know inside, oh yeah, that's coming. It's in module five, but that's cool. It's good that you know that that's what they're thinking about at that exact stage as they consume their content. And so that's it. And so now when you go to improve your content, and this is the tweak stage of the process, you can actually look at, you can say, okay, I want to revamp our curriculum. Um, or there is another way you can tell you need to revamp is people are asking the same questions over and over again in your Facebook group. That means that 
there might be some miscommunication in one of your lessons. And so this will help highlight that. Um, and this is just a way, basically, it makes your course more efficient, right? It makes your teaching better. Um, and that's what I'm here. That's my message for entrepreneurs. Like you can't teach something for the first time and just be totally done with it. It's not perfect. Um, there needs to be iterations. And so we're building in a system to help you iterate. And um, what that looks like as well, the tweaking stage of your course, um, there's a couple things you can do with this is you can have a frequently asked questions um, section that you can build under the module basically. And so that can be a holdover for a little while before re-recording any content or doing anything huge. You can basically have a VA pay attention, maybe monthly, maybe it's a task every month to look at the module level surveys and say, did any patterns come up that we need to be alerted to? Um, and if it's the same question over and over again, you got to put it in it just under it and just say, here are some, com some commonly asked questions when watching this module. And then the student is prepared. So when they have that exact same question, they're like, oh, I'm taken care of. I'm not the only one. I'm not dumb. They like actually know that there are other students who had that same question. And, um, and then like when you're ready to really revamp, then you can maybe redo the, that lesson or redo that section that was a little confusing or was missing um, that big frequently asked question. So yeah. So that's basically that. the process and how it works. Yeah, I think that this is a game changer. And I think after listening to all of this, do you see why you should only build one program ah, and yes. scale it to six figures before, even mm -hmm. multiple six figures mm -hmm. before you ever add another thing to your plate? I mean, we got Profit Cleaner Lounge to almost a half million dollar product before we added recurring profit, which we're adding now. Like, yep. it is so crucial. And and even then, I still am planning on optimizing the Profit Planner Lounge. We're about to redo the content for the second time just yeah. because I've gotten so many questions. And it's a, it's a year old, and I still see it as a baby. Whereas mm -hmm. most course creators or membership site owners are like, what three to five products can I create? It's like, <laughs> why don't we just pick one? Because then we can get really good and apply the survey system to it and keep tweaking. And that way what this survey, the information it's going to give you is going to make your messaging so strong so good. Yeah. that you're going to attract more people to that one course. I think we always fear, you know, your warm audience runs out. Mm. If your messaging can't sell to a cold audience, you have no scalable product. So mm -hmm. yeah, this is huge. This is a, a massive help. Thank you awesome. for just You're welcome. filling the beans. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you all my beans. I have lots yeah. of uh, teaching beans. <laughs> <laughs> well, where can people stalk you and hang out with you and find you? Yeah. So, um, I have a, a Facebook group called the teacher's lounge. Amazing. So it's, yeah, it's for entrepreneurs who want to up level their teaching and, um, and also share innovative things that we're doing, which again, we get ideas from sharing what's working in our courses. Um, and also how to learn how to build a, a really great, uh, course right from the get go. So the teacher's lounge is a great place. And I like hanging out on Instagram stories. I'm, I'm getting more intentional mm -hmm. with my Instagram. <laughs> I'm working on it. So, um, come watch me grow over there. It's definitely not like the most optimized thing yet for me, but um, it's a, a platform I'm focusing on um, this quarter for sure. And her handle is at Dr. Lindsay Padilla with an A, Lindsay with an A. Correct. Um, yes. Awesome. And we'll have all the links in the show notes, of course. Yay. Thank you again so much. You're amazing for coming on. Thanks, Haley. Thanks for having me.